So one of the primary tools you need when charging and flushing a system is a flat bladed screwdriver. So I carry a small one that fits in my tool belt or in my pocket. So this screwdriver is used both for turning the valve on the charging station and also bleeding the pumps. So the first thing we have to do, this valve is currently the slot in this, and the valve stem is in this direction, meaning the valve is open. So before I flush the system, I need to isolate the area where the liquid's coming in from the area where the waste uh, fluid is coming out. So I'm going to turn this valve with the screwdriver until the notch in the front of the valve stem is across the pipe. So that means that that valve is closed. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is verify that both of these handles are closed. And I'm going to open the covers that keep dirt out of the charging manifold. So now the manifold is ready to connect piping. And the next thing I'll do is make sure that both of my pumps bleed screws are loose enough that I can easily adjust them. So these screws have exactly four threads on them, which means you never really want to back them out more than about a turn and a half. If you rotate it more than one and a half times, you're getting to the point where the, the uh, bleeder screw will be in your hand rather than in the pump. Underneath the, the top of the screw is an O-ring, and so it's really not necessary to tighten these down very tight. You just tighten them until they're snug. If you over tighten these, you can damage the O-ring and then you have a leak that won't stop. So one of the things that's conveniently supplied with the Heliopack are these two adapters that are on the side. And so one of the things that I'd like to show is that this adapter actually is an O-ring connection. This is not a garden hose. And so what that means is that if you have the O-ring fitting in the H-pack, you really don't need any pressure. You don't have to tighten it down like you do a garden hose. So what I wanted, want to demonstrate is that if you put this connection in here and simply engage the O-ring like I've just done, that's a 300 PSI connection. And the only thing that the brass collar does is keep the O-ring from pushing out of the fitting. And so these fittings work really well and they don't leak. The problem is that they're not a garden hose, so you generally need an adapter to convert to an American garden hose. So the, what I've done is made a couple of little pieces of pipe. And with these pieces of pipe, I've bought reinforced clear plastic pipe and I've put one of these adapters supplied with the helio pack on one end and I've put a standard garden hose adapter on the other end. So this means that I can go to a garden hose, which I've plugged in the side of the building, and I can tighten up the fitting with the garden hose fitting. And then I can put this hose on the H-pack where I want to fill it with water. And so what this will do is provide water up to about 85 psi from the city water main to the H-pack. And then the next thing I need to do is get rid of the water that's going to come out of the exhaust. So remember this will have beads of solder and soldering flux. So this isn't really dirty water, you don't have to think about disposing of it, but this is just something you don't want pumped into your charging station. So I've made a second jumper using one of the adapters from an H-pack to another clear pipe and I'm putting it on the exhaust port on my charging manifold. And so what I really like about using clear tubing is that if I have bubbles in what I'm pumping, I can watch the bubbles going through my clear tubing. And so the other end of my clear tubing has an adapter which will go to a garden hose. And that way I can get the water coming out of the H-pack out of the garage that it's normally located in without making a mess on the floor. Okay, so what I've done is hooked up this jumper that I've made out of clear tubing to my garden hose, and I've pressurized my garden hose. And so this should currently be under a little over 80 pounds per square inch pressure. And so both of these ball valves are closed right now. And so what that means is that there's no liquid yet in my solar hot water system. 
So it's important that you charge systems early in the morning or late in the evening because if my collector is several hundred degrees and I hit it with cold water, not only does that cause thermal shock in the collector, but it also results in steam coming out of this. And that's usually not a good experience. And so it's, it's important the system be cool when you start this process. So what I'm going to do, and I'll talk through the process first and then I'll do it um, for you. But the thing that you need to understand is that when I open the lower valve, I should already have the upper valve open. That means I have basically no pressure in my system because any water that goes in can escape through the upper valve. As soon as I close my upper valve, we'll see the pressure gauge go from zero PSI up to probably about 85 PSI. So at this point, we've, we've put together all our piping in the house, but we really don't know at this point if we have any leaks. So that we're going to do two things in rapid succession. The first thing we're going to do is flush all the debris out of the system. And then the second thing we're going to do is close this valve. And that will result in pressure immediately going in the system. And then that pressure, we want to close this valve immediately so we quit supplying it with water. So if we watch the pressure gauge, if the gauge stays constant at 85 PSI, we know we have no leaks. If the gauge falls off rapidly, then we know we do. It's important that we close the supply valve quickly because we really don't want to pump gallons of water up into the roof of someone's house. Another thing that's important if you're going to use water pressure as a way of pressure testing is that you have an isolation valve between the H-pack and the expansion tank. The reason that's important is if you close the isolation valve, then the system will be full of water with no air. That means that there's no expansion volume. So a very small amount of water leaking out results in no pressure. If we didn't have a valve or we left this valve open to the expansion tank, as soon as we pressurize the system, at least a gallon and a half of water will flow through this pipe into the expansion tank. If it turns out we have a leak, that gallon and a half is going to flow back out through the leak into the ceiling in someone's house. So you can either pressure test with air or you can pressure test with water. And I'm showing you the water method uh, because it's much simpler, it's much faster. And in my experience works better because if you do have a leak, you have a wet spot on the pipe so you know where the leak is located. So here's the process for doing very rapidly a flush and a pressure test, one right after the other. This only takes a few minutes. So the first thing I'll do is open the upper valve. This way I can have no pressure in my system I'll also make sure the valve to my expansion tank is closed. This way I don't have an expansion problem causing a big leak. And next I'll open the supply valve to the garden hose. So this will fill my system with water. It'll flush out all the debris through this pipe. And once I have all the air out of my system, I'll close this valve which will produce pressure here. So here it goes. I'm opening the supply and you can hear the water rushing in. Here you can probably see a lot of bubbles came out of here. So there are bubbles going through my piping. This is why I use clear tubing so I can see the bubbles. Okay, so at this point I have almost no pressure on my pressure gauge. And I've also flushed all of the debris out of my system. I've probably got essentially all the air out of my system. Now I'm going to close this exit valve. Now the water can't get out and now we should see the pressure going rapidly up to about 85 PSI. And when it gets there, we immediately want to close the supply. So the reason we're closing the supply is to ensure that we can't have any source of water leaking out on the roof of our customer's house. And so because we see the pressure staying constant, we know we don't have a leak. If we even had a very small leak, you'd be able to watch this needle go down to zero very rapidly and something a little more than a tablespoon of water would come out of the piping, providing a wet spot so you know where to fix the piping problem. So this system is currently full of water and the supply pipe is at about 85 PSI and this return pipe is empty and our pressure gauge is reading 85 PSI in our system. 
So before we can fill this new clean system that we've pressure tested and flushed, we have to drain all the water we can out of the system. So the first step is that I'm going to disconnect the garden hose so that we have no pressure here. And actually I've gone off and done that. And then the next step is we want to vent all of the pressure out of our system. So I've opened the upper valve, the bottom valve is open. And now we've bled all the pressure out of our piping. So this is actually the lowest point on the system that I can get glycol or water out of right now. And that means that there's an unknown amount of water actually trapped in the heat exchanger and the pump right now. And so what I'm going to do is drain all I can. And when we do the charging process, I'll describe to you how to make it so you can get the correct concentration of glycol without worrying about the little bit of water left in your system. But for right now, what I'm going to do is disconnect this pipe. I'm going to make sure that this valve is at 45 degrees and this valve is at 45 degrees. And the reason I'm doing that is to ensure that water can flow both ways through the check valve. This system won't be able to drain unless the check valves in these valves are open. So at this point, I'm going to take this pipe off and that's only so you can see the water coming out. Normally, if I were in someone's house, I would leave this connected so that the water wouldn't land on their floor. Also, I normally bring a towel when I'm charging a system and I put the towel underneath the H-Pack to pick up any water or glycol that spills. The next thing I'm going to do is crack open part of the collector and that's simply to let air into the collector so that it can vent. Normally you'd open it at the highest point in the collector and that way the water can drain down through the collector, drain back into the piping and drain back out on the ground. Okay so normally I would keep a pipe on here so that we wouldn't end up making a mess on the floor in our customer's house but I'm simply removing the pipe so you can watch this drain. And so basically air is going in the top, going up through all the piping. All the piping is draining through the bottom. Normally we have to open a high point up on the roof so that air can come in the roof and drain the system out. So you can see that there's not really much water in here. This system, this particular, the H-Lab, holds only about a gallon of water. In a real setting with domestic hot water and a house with one collector, it would be normal to see about four gallons of water glycol mixture. Okay, so at this point, our system is empty and we're ready to fill it with glycol. And remember that we do have some water still sitting in the bottom of the heat exchanger. And so the next thing we'll talk about is how to mix glycol with the correct ratio, even with water left in the system.